Alrighty. So, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Trowbridge uh, here uh, from the Department of Entomology, which if you don't know where it is, is a few blocks on the way in Russell Lab. Um, Amy just joined uh, the faculty here at UW Madison uh, this year, so it's really exciting to have a chance to bring her over and get a chance to meet the CCR family and maybe find some connections between the work you're doing and elsewhere. So, uh, by way of background, um, Amy got her uh, undergraduate degree at the University of Illinois uh, in biology, and then she went on to do her PhD at the University of Colorado Boulder uh, in ecology and evolutionary biology, where she worked with uh, uh, Russ Monson. And then, uh, after graduating, uh, did a postdoc in Indiana, spent some time in Germany, started really building herself as a, a chemical ecologist, <laughs> which is a field that's kind of hot right now, and as you'll see the title is really focused on all these signals that plants and insects generate and communicate. It's kind of really cool stuff. Um, after her postdoc, she had joined a faculty at Montana State, and then as I mentioned, she just joined UW-Madison this year. I'm super happy to have you here, and the title of today's talk, Small Modules, Big Impacts, Understanding How Biological volatile organic compounds mediate interactions between forests, insects, and the atmosphere. As we know, this is actually the last CPAP seminar of the semester, which is a little scary sounding because the semester went too fast. But uh, part of that is because of holidays and conferences coming up. We will start up again in the spring semester at the same place at the same time. We'll continue our tradition of doing a post seminar reception at the set and our tradition of trying to encourage the initial questions after the seminar to come from early career and students. So, that to you. Okay. Um, I'm going to get this um, Thank you so much for the invitation and thank you all for coming. It's exciting for me to get out of Russell Labs um, and walk, even if it is very cold over here, to talk to you about a topic that I'm really, as August, I'm really excited about. Um, which is how BVOCs and other um, secondary metabolites mediate interactions between forests and sex in the atmosphere. Um, and so I, my animations were slow, just like me. <laughs> um, and so first, I just want to thank my funding sources and my collaborators, without whom none of this work um, could be done. A lot of the work I'm going to talk about today has been funded by the National Science Foundation and the Department of Energy. Um, and a lot of the players, uh, Jose Fuentes, uh, Will Pachman, Henry Adams, um, let's see who else is on it, Nate McDowell, and Dean Bowers. So um, I am really interested, and my lab in general, is interested in improving current process-based models um, by understanding how climate is um, influencing plant secondary metabolites and VOCs, how herbivores are um, interacting with climate to impact VOCs and other secondary metabolites, and then how that chemistry is um, altering plant-insect interactions, specifically how insects may perceive and choose their host, um, but also how those compounds then, how those compounds then are influencing um, the climate in some really important ways. And so I do a lot of work with secondary metabolites in general, but today this talk is mostly gonna focus on volatile organic compounds um, of the biogenic variety. And so what are BVOCs, right? So these are just trace gases other than CO2 and carbon monoxide and methane, right, that are emitted from plants. And what's really interesting about these trace gases is even though you see the word trace, it's actually a substantial amount of carbon that these plants are re-emitting into the atmosphere, right? So somewhere between 10 to 20% of recently fixed carbon is re-emitted into the atmosphere as these trace gases, which is a lot. Um, and the types of compounds that we see being emitted can be incredibly diverse. There's over 1,700 different BVOCs that have been identified from plants. Um, and they are emitted in the significant amounts because of their high vapor pressures. But um, as most things, some things are just more important than others, right? So the most dominant BVOCs that we tend to observe um, are isoprene, this is a big player, 
Uh, terpenes, specifically monoterpenes, which are 10 carbon molecules that I'll talk about. And then those are followed closely by alcohols and carbonyls. So, as I alluded to, terpenes, which I'm going to mostly focus on today, um, they're my class of choice, not only because they are the largest and most diverse class, but they also smell like Christmas, which is a bonus. Um, and so these are highly reactive compounds um, that I'm going to talk about more in a second, but I just want to give you an overview of what they are and how they're produced, right? So these terpenoid compounds are produced either through one of two pathways, um, through what's known as the MEP pathway, which happens here in plastics, this is a chloroplast, um, or the MBA or the mevalonic acid pathway that's occurring up here in the cytosol. Um, and from these two pathways, they generate a huge array of different species of individual compounds. Right, so over 560 compounds, um, I say approximately, they quote this as 566, but who's counting? 566 compounds have been identified as being produced from these two pathways. Right, and so what's interesting here is that regardless of which way you go, all of these compounds come from the same five carbon precursor molecule. So all of them are basically found in multiples of five, right? Um, and so this diversity then is really, it really arises because of a different suite of synthase enzymes that are present that actually take precursor molecules that enter these pathways and just twist them and oxygenate them or methylate them in ways to create all these different um, isomers and, and flavors. So the diversity in part is due to these synthase enzymes, but also the diversity can arise from a suite of environmental factors, right? So both abiotic and biotic stressors that are present at any given time in the environment. So the most common biotic agent that we think about um, are herbivores, right? So just that wounding and secretions, these enzymes in the saliva of the herbivores can actually upregulate the production of specific um, VOC uh, compounds. And then a whole suite of um, different abiotic factors, UV, ozone, temperature, light, and nutrient availability. And so both these constitutive BVOCs, right, the ones that plants are just making because they're plants and that's what they do, and these induced VOCs from stress can serve as ecological signals in a lot of different ways, right? So we know that when plants emit these BVOCs, they can play roles in plant-plant interactions. So this is a parasitic daughter plant that finds its host, in this case a tomato plant, from the VOCs that it's producing. It just swings around randomly until it can smell it enough to latch on, which is awesome. Um, these VOCs play roles in plant nematode interactions. So this is a plant root, and the nematodes find their host based on very specific compounds that plants emit. Um, other plant interactions, plant-insect interactions, so pollinators, of course, um, but also VOCs can repel herbivores as well, be directly repellent, and they play roles in tritrophic interactions, right? So where herbivores feed on plants, plants emit VOCs, and then those attract the natural enemies of the herbivores. And so from this illustration here, you can kind of see these herbivore-induced VOCs as one example, um, are kind of eliciting different behaviors throughout the community, which then alters the overall community dynamics in really important ways. So one of the earliest examples looking at the ecological significance of BVOCs, or in this case, herbivore-induced plant volatiles, um, were studies in the late 80s and early 90s that showed that these volatiles could attract the natural enemies of herbivores and serve as a type of indirect defense for plants, right? So um, Marcel Dickey did some work on this in the late 80s with spider mites and predatory mites, and then um, Ted Turley did some work in the, in the 90s looking at moth larvae and parasitoid wasps. So what I'm showing you here, this is um, a parasitic wasp, and these guys are cool because they have actually evolved, their ovipositors don't inject venom, they inject eggs. Right? And so what they do is when their host species, in this case an aphid, feeds on a plant, that plant gives off a very specific bouquet of BVOCs that that parasitic wasp uses to locate that host. And then it injects eggs into the herbivore, right? so it lays its eggs in the hemocele, 
those eggs will hatch, the larvae will eat the insect from the inside out, and then pupate within it or without it, depending on what species it is. So this is actually a mummy of a caterpillar, and all these individual circles are actually larvae of parasitoids, right? Same here. You can see all the individual larvae that have just made a home in the insect. And these larvae have actually made its way out of the insect and have pupated on the outside. So it's like aliens, basically awesome. And, um, and so there are over 25 different predators and parasitoids that can use these BBOCs to locate their host and complete their life cycle, or at least part of their life cycle. Um, and so this can benefit the plant, right, because it'll actually, in some cases, slow the herbivore down from feeding, but it's been really hard to show that there's a fitness benefit to the plant, right? That they're actually able to increase um, fitness in, in um, subsequent generations. But uh, anyway, that's like the coolest example. So, you know, since these first studies of plant volatiles, there's been a, a lot of interest in understanding controls over BBOCs, right? And then their ecological impacts. And both of which then have really important consequences for ecosystem processes and ecosystem function. But when we're talking about controls over BBOCs, we're mostly talking about how the plant is controlling the synthesis and the emissions, right? But once those BBOCs are emitted from the plant, the plant can no longer control what goes on or what that end product is, right? Whether or not they can stick around long enough to impact these interactions or if they're going to react with some other um, you know, oxidizing agent within the atmosphere, which a lot of them tend to do, especially these terpenoids, right? And so we have these compounds then being emitted into the atmosphere, and they are highly reactive with species like ozone, hydroxyl radicals, nitrate radicals, et cetera. Um, and so that has a really big impact ultimately on ozone levels, right, regional ozone levels, but they can also react with these and then go on to form secondary organic aerosols, right? That can serve as cloud condensation nuclei. Then we can make these little clouds, happy little clouds like Bob Ross paintings. And then we make these happy little clouds that affect the radiated budget of ecosystems, altering photosynthesis, carbon gain by plants, and then how much carbon is actually going to be able to be allocated to these BBOCs. So there's lots of complicated feedbacks that these BBOCs are mediating, not just in terms of the ecology, but the atmosphere and feedbacks on the ecosystem. So um, we've actually done quite a bit of work down in the tropics uh, assessing emission profiles and the potential for those emissions to impact atmospheric processes. Um, and so the atmospheric chemistry part of this is way above my pay grade. Um, I say I'm a chemical ecologist, but I'm more ecologist than chemist um, in that perspective. So I'm going to focus a lot of my talk today on the ecology, but I just want to give some teaser data so that some of you will be enticed to come and have a beer with me later and talk more about chemistry, where I can um, go into more details here. But we've done some work um, in the Amazon looking at emissions above tropical forest canopies and impacts on um, atmospheric chemistry. And what you'll see here from this very um, beautiful, colorful pie chart is that the emission profile is mostly dominated by methanol and isoprene, right? With isoprene being very reactive, having very short lifetimes um, in the atmosphere. And what's interesting though, is now I'm gonna show you some graphs from a colleague and a collaborator of ours, um, Angie Jardine. Um, so what she has found is something very similar to what we've found in these Amazonian um, canopies, which is that this is typically what the composition looks like, right? So if you see, if I can go back here for one second, I'm showing you that isoprene makes up almost 40%, right? Methanol, 32%. And then there's this little slice of the pie, terpenes, which make up 6%, which doesn't seem like a lot. But they are also highly reactive, like I was just mentioning. And so understanding that composition is really important. And what you can see here is that above these tropical forests, limonene is making up 45% um, of the profile, right? And if you look over here, this is basically telling you the potential to react with ozone or to consume ozone. And so limonene is emitted in high, at high levels and also um, reacts with ozone fairly rapidly, right? The reaction rate is fairly high. However, if you look over here, you can see terpinaline only makes up 
of the 6% of terpenes, right, but has a relatively high reaction rate with ozone, right? The same for cis beta osamine and trans beta osamine, only making up a very small proportion, but are very reactive and can influence ozone concentration. And so when we're thinking about emission models, global emission models, right, it's very important that we get a better description of the compounds that are emitted, right, and the exchange, exchange processes, right? So it's like, how are they being exchanged at these local, regional, and global levels, right? So that we can put them back into models like the Megan model, right, um, and enhance and improve um, the ability to predict <coughs> models in the face of global change. The other thing I want to mention is that we've been doing lots of work in the tropics, which are very understudied, um, but also soils, we know virtually nothing or very little about emissions from soils. The other thing we need to do to improve these global emission models is to better understand factors that influence the release of VOCs from different sources. And that seems pretty straightforward, but sources are very tricky because they change over time and space depending on the prevailing environmental conditions. How much ozone is there? Do you have NOx? Is there an herbivore stressing these plants out? Are there nutrient deficiencies, et cetera? So this can be incredibly tricky, so I thought, why not make a career out of it? Um, so, that seems like a good idea. So basically the work that we do on BVOCs um, is trying to understand responses at the leaf level, right, to abiotic and biotic factors um, in terms of BVOCs how those are then influencing ecological interactions and then implications for chemistry and these complicated feedbacks. But today, um, I don't know why that's happening, um, but today what I wanna do is uh, focus a little bit just on the work we've been doing to kind of understand these controls over BVOC emissions with some ecology and atmospheric fun thrown in there. So I'm gonna kind of have three different sections. I'm gonna first talk about consequences of drought and herbivory on BVOCs and herbivore performance, talk about the impact of warm, prolonged drought, so these hot droughts you guys may have heard of, and how that influences carbon allocation to terpenes, and then the effect of herbivory on carbon allocation towards VOCs with some consequences for atmospheric chemistry. Okay, now we can do this. Okay, so let's start with this first one right here. Um, okay, so one example of how drought and herbivory um, are interacting to influence VVOCs can be found in the western United States, right? You guys have probably heard that there are lots of droughts happening, lots of bark beetle outbreaks, et cetera, which is kind of um, my area of expertise. So unfortunately, with global warming, these episodic droughts and heat waves, we see that these trees, these conifer forests in particular, are under elevated stress, both acute and chronic, right? And because of the stress, then it makes them more vulnerable to different forest insects, and pathogens and diseases, and as a result, we tend to see um, large-scale mortality events. And while I mentioned the Western United States, which is where I do a lot of my work, this is not you know, just here in North America, right? These large-scale mortality events because of drought-induced um, and insect-induced mortality <coughs> is worldwide, right? So this is a map showing all these little circles are uh, mortality events uh, across the globe since 1970. Right? And so you can see that these events have happened on every single continent, um, with the exception of Antarctica, which they didn't even bother to put on this map. Um, it does exist. And so because uh, this is such a widespread phenomenon and a really important one to understand, there's been a large thrust in the research community to understand mechanisms of drought-induced tree mortality. In other words, how to choose that, right? Um, and so, We've been testing whether trees die from water limitation, right, from xylem cavitation. So these are just kind of air bubbles in the xylem, from carbon starvation, or from biotic agents. I don't know why this is going crazy right now. Um, and so a lot of work, though, has focused mostly on understanding these carbon and water dynamics. And as a result, then, the models have followed the data where a lot of models looking to predict forest mortality mostly focus on tree physiological responses and rarely on insect responses to tree stress physiology or tree chemistry. So, I think you guys had Jackie Mathis here and she talked a lot about insects and how important they are to models. 
So maybe she already said this, but despite how important they are, insects are rarely included in global vegetation models, right? And so our lab is really trying to improve models by providing what I consider to be this missing link, right, between climate, tree stress physiology, um, and insect responses, which is a better understanding of tree defenses, right? There's my, I have to have like a token Green Bay Packer picture now that I live in Wisconsin, apparently. Um, and so what we're really trying to do is to understand how tree defenses, right, are mediating interactions um, with these insects. So insect interactions with host tree chemical defenses in terms of VVOCs and foliar chemistry in response to climate. So as I mentioned before, um, I really like terpenes. And the one class of terpenes that um, I find the most fascinating are a group called monoterpenes. So this is because these are the dominant compounds um, within, I don't know why this is happening. <laughs> I'm gonna just like, I don't know how to do this. Um, let me try and do this really quick. And I just go like this. I don't know. Okay, I'm gonna hope, hopefully that has fixed it. I don't know. Um, okay, so our monoterpenes, right? So monoterpenes um, are these cyclic 10 carbon molecules, right? So there's only 10 carbons here, multiple of five. Um, and they are stored in resin canals, resin blisters, and resin ducts in conifers, um, which is my preferred study system. Um, and so what I'm showing you here is a resin duct, right, or a resin canal. And you can see that it's lined by these plastid-rich epithelial cells. So all the monoterpenes are made, and then they're secreted into the lumen, and they're held there under pressure, right, until an insect or something comes and breaks the needle, and then all that resin um, comes out. And so resin then can be a physical defense, right, against insects and pathogens, but it can also be a chemical defense. And because there's, um, because these compounds have such high vapor pressures, uh, they easily, like I said, volatilize into the atmosphere and can also serve defensive roles in that state as well. So what are some ways that monoterpenes can affect ecological interactions or multitrophic interactions? Well, one way is from the top down. Right, so as I've kind of alluded to, these compounds can play a really important role in host location for parasitoids to find their herbivore hosts. Um, they can also play host location roles in terms of herbivores just finding their host tree, right? Um, so, like that little bug beetle. Oh my god, it's still doing it. I don't know what's happening. It's possessed. I'm sorry. I, I don't know. Um, it can also influence uh, interactions from the bottom up, right, where these monoterpenes can be direct like directly toxic to different herbivores. They can serve as feeding deterrents if you're a generalist or a feeding stimulant if you're a specialist. Um, and these compounds can actually influence the immune response to parasitism um, and can influence herbivore growth rates, which I'll talk a little bit about. So that's how monoterpenes influence these interactions, but how, um, how are different factors influencing the synthesis and emission of monoterpenes? Well, like all things, they're mostly under genetic control, but the emissions are largely um, controlled by diffusion, right? So different levels of resistance uh, across a leaf. Obviously herbivores, right? So as an herbivore bites a needle, it exposes resin ducts to the atmosphere where they can volatilize, but also, like I said, they have these enzymes in their saliva that can upregulate the production of specific compounds. And they're also controlled by a suite of global change factors, so temperature, drought, CO2, et cetera. And so what I was really interested in is this interaction between herbivory and then heat and drought stress. So what I decided to do was to find a hot, dry place that was undergoing an insect outbreak, and this happened to be in south central Colorado at a beautiful location known as Penitente Canyon for anyone who's a climber. Um, and so this is where I could really try to understand how natural variation, right, seasonal variation in temperature and precipitation interacts with um, this cute little guy, which is known as the Southwestern Tiger Moth. So in order to um, do some work down here, I needed to really understand the natural history of the Southwestern Tiger Moth, as well as what the temperature and precipitation dynamics are in the Southwest. 
So let me tell you about this tiger moth first. So the southwestern tiger moth is native to this area. It's a specialist on pinion pine, which means it only feeds on pinion. Um, and it has this really unique life history where um, they're univoltine, which means that they only reproduce once a year. And so they do most of their feeding early in the season, so April and May, where there's high levels of herbivory. They feed and feed and feed in order to get enough um, reserves to then go underground and pupate. So then they pupate through June, and then they emerge in July, and they fly around August as adults, find their mates, then they lay their eggs, and their eggs hatch, and then they start feeding gregariously on pinion. And they form these beautiful white silken tents which they overwinter in, so they don't actually go through diapause, they go through incomplete diapause, which means when it gets kind of sunny out, they can still come out and feed. But most of the feeding happens here um, in the beginning of the season. Temperature at this site looks something like this. It's cooler at the beginning of the season, increases throughout the summer, peaks in July, and then takes a little dip here at the later part of the season, and this is because that's when this area is getting the bulk of their precipitation in the form of these monsoon rains. Right? And so we have, you know, this temperature, we have temperature, we have precipitation, and we have herbivory all kind of interacting in these unique ways. And so what does that mean for how trees invest in BVOCs and defensive chemistry? So this is what we found. So what I'm showing you are total monoterpene emissions here um, throughout the season. And the black represents trees that had significant um, tiger moth damage and uh, or sorry, the black represents the undamaged trees, and then the gray represents the trees that had significant, significant tiger moth damage. And what you can see is that in the beginning of the season, when they're feeding the most, probably unsurprisingly, the herbivore damaged trees have significantly higher rates of emissions relative to undamaged. And you're like, yeah, whatever. You already told me that was going to happen. But what's cool is that it's not just from damaged branches that we sample. We sample damaged trees, but on undamaged branches which means that the tree is sending a systemic signal telling that branch to still emit BVOCs even though those needles weren't damaged, which is super cool. Then what you see is as the temperature, see it's possessed, I don't know why, as the temperature increases right throughout the summer, and now we have no more herbivory, emissions are no longer different, right? but we see them continue to decrease, which might be counterintuitive to you because it was for me. Then, with the onset of these monsoon rains and this release from drought stress, we see a significant increase in both previously damaged and undamaged trees, but an interaction with previous insect damage, where those that had been fed upon before actually emitted higher levels of monoterpenes relative to their undamaged counterparts. Um, and then in September, there was once again no difference. But what I want to point out is that in the middle of the summer, that's when we see the lowest emissions, even though it was the hottest time of the year. So just keep that in your back of your noggin. Um, so what was going on in the needles, right? So all these compounds are made in the needles and then they're emitted into the atmosphere. So what's going on here? So these are total monoterpene concentrations in the needles. And what you can see is that during feeding and for three months after, there's this trend towards those herbivore damaged trees having lower levels of concentrations in the needles, right? So remember, there was that huge burst of emissions early in the season, and it looks kind of like it never really recovered. But this was only significant in the middle of the season here in July. Oh my goodness. Um, and then what's interesting then is in September, after the monsoon, everything kind of goes back to normal, right? So what's happening in this system? Basically what we see is that herbivory um, and these abiotic factors are acting in series to control monoterpene emissions, right? So remember, here in May, during feeding, we see high emissions. During the summer, with the drought, we see low emissions. And then, with these monsoon rains and this interaction with previous herbivory, we once again see an increase in emissions, which is really interesting, right? And it suggests that there's some importance then to considering water limitations of insects and not just temperature in these emission models, which we tend to do. Um, what was also interesting is when we see these huge emission rates in May, we saw low concentrations in those herbivore damaged trees. And so that got me thinking, well, are emissions, these huge emission rates, making it so they can't keep up, so that concentrations are lower, and does that lower 
level of these you know, compounds that are typically toxic, does that affect the herbivore's feeding? And then does that actually affect how it can respond to parasitism? And I'm not going to go through that entire experiment. It was super cool, but spoiler alert, the answer is yes. So what is happening in this system looks something like this. We have these caterpillars feeding on these pinions, right? And there are these huge bursts of emission. And as a result then, whoops, as a result, we see lower concentrations of monoterpenes in the needles themselves. <coughs> this allows caterpillars to increase their consumption rate. Right? So consumption rates were significantly higher on these trees with lower levels. And because of that, we actually did some experiments where we injected silica beads into these caterpillars, and we saw how they responded as like a proxy for the parasitism eggs. And we saw that because they could feed more, they actually had more resources to allocate towards their immune response. And so they were more effective um, against parasitoids as a result. And so that seems to suggest, whoops, that seems to suggest that there's some, I don't know why this thing hates me, but it does, um, that there might be some sort of positive feedback loop going on here during an outbreak. Right? We have more feeding, so you have higher emissions, lower concentrations, and then these caterpillars are more, um, they're better defended against parasitism. However, just because you're better defended against parasitism is not a direct proxy to resistance, right? Because we don't really know what the fitness result, like the fitness cost might be. And also, it's possible that these higher emissions are actually calling, right, for more parasitoids. So the parasitism load might be even higher. Um, and so those are just some caveats to consider. But I want to go back to this. So during our dry, hot American summer that I just described to you, right, um, I told you that, look at the emissions during the hottest part of the year were the lowest. And that does not make any sense. So we had high foliar concentrations during that time of the year, and we had low monoterpene emissions. What the heck is going on? And so that made me wonder, you know, we have high temperatures, but we also have low water availability. So really, what is the primary driver for monoterpene emissions and synthesis during that time? Was it the high temperatures? Probably not. Or is it the water limitation? Probably. And so this is what we would expect from the models. This is basically how models um, predict emissions. We would expect that as temperature increases, we should see an exponential increase in these monoterpene emissions. And that is not at all what we saw. And so, oops, and so what we do see, though, um, is a decrease. And that is what we would predict under drought stress, right? So as drought, it says time, but think of this as drought. As drought progresses, under mild to moderate drought, we might see an increase. But really, under more severe drought stress, we would tend to see a decrease in investment in these defense compounds, EVOCs, et cetera. So we wanted to test this. So what I did was I collaborated with some folks at um, University of Arizona, where they had this beautiful experiment where they had taken pinion pine from its normal habitat, um, and they dug these mature pinions out of the ground, and they brought them to a desert where there is no vegetation, and they planted them there to simulate hotter and drier conditions. Right. And so what you can see here is that there was a difference in temperature, right? So this desert site is hotter, um, about 1.5 degrees hotter. It's also um, under more drought stress. So the megapascals, the more negative that number is, the more drought stress those trees are. So they were super drought stressed. They're more drought stressed. They're hotter. And as a result, we saw lower um, gas exchange. So lower photosynthetic rates and lower semental conductance. And so what I thought was, OK, at this desert site, the needles are going to be hotter. So that means, if, the mo if we're modeling this correctly, that the emission rate should be higher. And as a result, we're going to see lower concentrations because we're blowing off all this carbon as these BVOCs. OK, so what did we find? Basically, um, so what I'm showing you here, this is total monoterpenes in the needles. So these are foliar concentrations. And the black is the desert site, the hotter, drier site, and the gray is the ambient. And what you can see is that over the entire growing season, we tend to see lower levels of, of these monoterpenes in the foliage, right? And so, awesome. We know that the needle temperatures were definitely higher, and we saw lower concentrations. So I was expecting then emission rates to be much higher, right? 
and that is not at all what we saw. So these are total monoterpene basal emission rates across the growing season at both sites, and you can see that they track one, they track the seasonality, but there's no difference between these sites. So what this suggests is that yes, temperature may matter, but that might matter when they're well watered. When these trees are under drought stress, that drought is overriding that temperature in terms of controlling these BDOC emissions, yet we do not have any parameter in these models that accounts for water limitation. So, no emission rates. <laughs> Data to support my hypothesis. Um, okay, so now I kind of want to move on and talk about the impacts of warmer and longer droughts. So the droughts that I've been talking about were just kind of seasonal droughts, like that's normal for this for this area, but we know that droughts are getting hotter. So, what about the impact of warmer and longer droughts on carbon allocation to terpene synthesis? So, a great place to study this is in the southwest, because not only are droughts occurring at higher frequencies, but they are definitely hotter there. And in the early 2000s, the southwest had one of its worst droughts on record. So, again, this is the pinyon juniper woodland in the southwest. This is favorite place to work, um, and this is a picture taken by Craig Allen, and you can see um, not only are they drought stressed, but all of these trees, almost all of these trees are dying because of bark beetle infestations, right? Um, and so if you look at this in 2002, you might say, wow, these trees, are, they're going to they're gonna make it. Those guys, they're going to make it. No, actually. Um, they've actually already been infested by bark beetles, and so when we look at the same picture, Two years later, um, we can see that none of the pinions did it. So now you see all of them that were in the red stage are now in the gray stage, um, and some that were in the green are now in the red. And this is because they had already reached their point of no return in terms of biotic agents, right? And so wouldn't it be great, instead of coming in post-mortem, which we like to do, and trying to understand what happened, if we could go in before then and predict which areas might be most vulnerable to drought and insect attack and come up with some management strategies. And so what I would argue is that if we can better understand how monoterpenes and these defense compounds are being synthesized and emitted in response to drought, this could help us predict that because <coughs> monoterpenes play such a critical role in bark beetle chemical ecology, right? And the reason I say this is because um, at high concentrations of these compounds, right, so when alpha-pinene and myrcene are emitted in high concentrations, they're very toxic to bark beetles, right, and they are very effective repellents. When they're emitted in low concentrations, when these trees are stressed, they actually become um, an asset to the bark beetle, where the bark beetles can take them up, oxidize them, and actually produce aggregate pheromones to call all their friends to come and help them eat these trees, right? So, for example, alpha-pinene, um, this negative enantiomer, when it's released at low concentrations, the bark beetles, um, in this case, this guy, Ips confusus, or the pinion Ips, they, um, they ingest it and then they oxidize it to make um, the cis form of verbanol, which is a very effective aggregate pheromone. Um, and then, in the presence of myrcene, they can actually make these two enantiomers of this alcohol, it's dienol, which then synergizes that signal and makes it even more effective. Um, and so when we're thinking about these monoterpenes and bark beetle ecology, it's important to note that monoterpenes are incredibly expensive, right? Not only in the terms of the carbon that you need to make them, but also thinking about the synthase enzymes and the resources that are needed for their synthesis. And so um, monoterpenes are made from recently fixed carbon, right, but also from non-structural carbohydrates, so stored carbon. Uh, but what's important to note is that all of that carbon isn't just going into constitutive and induced secondary metabolites or terpenes, right? That carbon has to be allocated to other functions like reproduction and growth and storage. And so these trade-offs and these interactions are incredibly complex. And when you add drought stress on top of it, you can just imagine that all of these signals get kind of, kind of messy. And so we wanted to know, though, how does drought stress, hot droughts, how does that influence carbon allocation to these VOCs, to these terpenes? Um, and can we kind of glean anything from those non-structural carbohydrate pools in terms of what carbon is going where? 
And so to do this, we collaborated with um, some colleagues at the Los Alamos National Lab on a project known as SUMO, or Survival Mortality. And so what they did down there was they um, had these open top chambers around uh, reproductively mature pinion trees. And what that allowed them to do was to heat uh, trees about 4.8 degrees above ambient continuously over four years, right? So they had these huge air conditioner and heating systems attached to them. So at any moment during the year, those were heated 4.8 degrees above ambient. Um, and then they also have these like transparent uh, gutter systems, which are rainout shelters, right? To divert precipitation, about 45% of ambient precipitation away from the trees, which resulted in four different treatments. We had ambient trees, we had trees that were just experiencing heat stress, heat that just experienced drought, and heat and drought. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, so we have a ton of data from the study, and hopefully you'll see it published next year, uh, but in the meantime, I'm just gonna give you the highlight reel, which is this. Basically, heat and drought alter monoterpene concentrations in significant ways. Right, so we looked at needles, right, monoterpenes from the needles, and we looked at monoterpenes in the woody tissue, right, because that's where the bark beetles are actually, are actually feeding. And what you can see here, this is ambient heat, drought, and heat plus drought, and what you can see is that in both tissue types, the drought and the heat plus drought increase total monoterpenes relative especially to this heat treatment, right? And then what's interesting is that there was no difference um, in the, from the heated trees to the ambient trees, but in the woody tissue, it does seem that the heat can exacerbate um, this drought signal. Well, thank you. Next slide. Um, and so we see this increase in monoterpenes, and we are thinking, gosh, these trees are drought stressed. Why are they allocating carbon to these, to these volatile compounds? This is crazy. And where could that possibly be coming from, right? So here we see total monoterpenes um, as trees become more and more drought stressed, and we see this trend, right? This increase um, in monoterpenes. And what we also saw when we looked at the non-structural carbohydrate data is that as trees become more and more drought stressed, we see an increase in the available glucose and fructose, right? And so we thought, oh, that's pretty awesome. Um, let's look at some other NSC tools, like, I don't know, starch. And so what was also interesting then is as we saw an increase in monoterpenes in the tissue, right, not only did we see this increase in glucose, but we saw this simultaneous decrease um, in starch, suggesting potentially that starch is being hydrolyzed into these glucose monomers that are then going into the production of these monoterpenes under drug stress. So that was pretty wild and was shocking to my ecophysiology friends who were like, there's no way a tree would invest in defense when it's drought stressed. It only needs to respire. Ha, neat. Um, so anyway, that's, another, that's for another day. Or have a beer with me. So what did we find in this system? Basically what we found is that under reduced precipitation, we see an increase in investment in these monoterpenes in this conifer species. But when we looked at individual monoterpenes, which I don't have time to show you all of the data, we saw a lot of increases for individual compounds, but some, no change, and some decrease. When we look at temperature, we basically saw no difference in total monoterpenes. And when we looked at individual compounds, we saw no change, and for just a few of them, we actually saw that the heat treatment reduced those levels, right? And remember, these individual compounds are really what's driving the ecological interactions, not just the total. And so then we said, okay, what is responsible for this increase? Well, we think that starch is being hydrolyzed into these glucose monomers that is then going into the production of different monoterpenes, right? So it's altering the composition of these monoterpenes in the needles, and thus the monoterpenes that are getting emitted into the atmosphere, and they are having important effects whoops, on bark beetles. But in this particular experiment, because when you put, um, just a side note, when you put a big plastic shield around a tree, that is not enticing for a bark beetle. They don't want to go there. And so we couldn't really gauge uh, whether bark beetles were responding, and so we have a new project where we are not doing that, but we are doing rainout shelters um, to try and determine when bark beetles might find these trees um, most susceptible for attack. So what we really need, and
And what we're doing now is to identify thresholds under more severe drought stress, right? So these are the data from SUMO, where we see increased investment in these monoterpenes as drought progresses, but we know that's not sustainable, right? At some point, they're gonna close their stomata to never be opened again, and there's only so much carbon available um, for defense. And so at what point then, along this drought continuum, do we see defenses decreasing? And more importantly, how does this shift in individual compounds affect bark beetle choice and performance? So we're doing a huge rain out shelter experiment at the Sevilleta in New Mexico, and we're addressing this then. Okay, so finally I just want to talk a little bit about the effect of herbivory on carbon allocation towards BPOCs and some of the consequences for atmospheric chemistry. So when we think about in canopy reactions, whether this is a tropical rainforest or a pinion juniper woodland, right, the, the chemistry really depends on radiation, right, ozone, NOx, air parcel residence, and most importantly, for me, individual BBOC flux, right? So when we think about these reactions, we always just put BBOCs, and then we have the reactions with ozone, right? Or we have these reactions to create secondary organic aerosols. But it's not just BBOCs. We really need to know how individual compounds are being synthesized and emitted and at what rates, right? And so part of that is understanding mechanisms that are allocating carbon to individual compounds. Remember when I told you that from one pre precursor molecule, all these different terpenes can be made, right? That has a lot to do with allocation of that precursor to various synthase enzymes. So there's a carbon story, and there's a gene regulation story for the synthase. So what I'm showing you here um, is basically, oh my gosh, there we go. Um, what I'm showing you here is basically how these are made, right? So we know that um, these compounds are made from recently fixed carbon from the Calvin cycle and also from some stored carbon, right, coming from these hexose phosphates. And they come together in the chloroplast to make monoterpenes and actually from this precursor can also make isoprene, right? And so how can we determine where carbon is coming from? How can we determine if it's coming from new carbon or old carbon? And we can do that using a stable isotope label, right? So we use 13 CO2 and we fumigate trees with this label, and then we can use an instrument known as a proton transfer reaction mass spec that allows us to monitor these trace gases in real time, and not only that, can allow us to calculate the proportion of the label that's then found in um, these individual compounds. So I'm gonna show you how, how we do that just here. So one compound, or a good example, is methylbutanol. So methylbutanol is this guy here, this five carbon um, alcohol that's made only by Western North American conifers, which is just cool in and of itself. So um, we usually think about isoprene being the most reactive compound that trees produce, but this guy uh, people lovingly call the isoprene of the West, and so Paul made me put this little drink in there. So this is the isoprene of the West, right? Um, and so it's highly reactive, and these conifers blow this stuff off in super high quantities, right? And so it's made from the same way that monoterpenes are, except that it's made from this precursor and not further down there, right? And so what we can do is we can label this carbon, and we can trace it, right? We do a pulse, um, a pulse chase experiment, and we can trace it into this molecule. And we can watch in real time as each individual carbon becomes labeled. And so what I'm showing you here um, is just uh, an experiment that we did with these pinion, or these are ponderosas, looking at MBO. And um, what, I'm gonna walk you through this, but I'm hoping that this won't just like freak out on me. Um, but basically, this looks complicated, but it's really not. You just need to know that this gray line is showing you CO2 levels, right? So this is during the day, during the night, during the day. And so you can see here, CO2 is usually at 415 in the chamber, parts per million. Here it's at 300, so we have photosynthesis. No photosynthesis at night, photosynthesis. What I'm trying to show you is that the production of MBO is tightly coupled to photosynthesis, because as you'll see when it's photosynthesizing, this red line is MBO, and it is just off the charts. These trees, these ponderosas are just blowing this stuff off like there's no tomorrow. 
right? So we have high levels of MBO during the day, low, nothing at night, and then high during the day. And then what's happening here is we've labeled it with this 13 CO2. And so, of course, MBO, which shows up here on the PTRMS as mass overcharge 87, drops out. That's because we've labeled one carbon. So now it becomes mass 88, this blue line. So you can see mass 88 increases, and then it drops out because we've labeled now two carbons, which is mass 89, which increases and kind of stable, stabilizes to become then three carbons labeled, which is mass 90, four carbons labeled, and five carbons labeled, which is mass 92. At the end, we can calculate the proportion of incorporation relative to the natural abundance and say which, how much of that molecule is being um, synthesized from new carbon. So this is just constitutive. This is just what these ponderosas do normally, right? But how does that change under stress? So what we did was we sprayed a phytohormone known as methylgazinate, which simulates herbivory without actually cutting the plant. Um, and we wanted to see what happens. The first thing that happens is photosynthesis is strongly um, downregulated, right? So you can see now we have very little drawdown of CO2, maybe 15 parts per million. And as a result, MBO emissions are relatively low. So this is in the morning, so these trees are kind of ramping up. Right? And we get to, I don't know, about 2,000 counts per second, which isn't a lot. And then we started to label. And as you can see, MBO goes down, but now we're not seeing, this is if five carbons, four and three carbons were labeled, and that's barely any signal, right? And so not only are emissions much lower because photosynthesis is knocked down, but then a lot of the label is coming from stored carbon. And so we're doing that with our bibri, but we're also doing that with our pinions in response to drought stress to try and see um, how carbon is being allocated under these various conditions. And so, in all, I just want to finish by saying, you know, we can improve Earth system models by incorporating <coughs> VOC insect interactions, even though that might seem crazy to a lot of people. And I think that models aren't really doing as well as they can because they're failing to incorporate first principles, geez Louise, first principles um, of you know ecophysiology, secondary metabolism, and then insect responses, particularly how these trees are responding um, to insects and other abiotic stresses. And so with that, I will leave you with some take-home messages that are, and this is gonna probably switch in about five seconds anyway, um, that you can read quickly, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. <laughs> Time for some questions. I was so clear. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Do any trees after they die still in it? Do you see? Yeah. Mm -hmm. They do. Um, they have these, you know, these storage reservoirs in the in the resin canals, and you know, basically these monoterpenes are hydrophobic, and so. Um, they can be released just through the cuticle. So there's cuticular diffusion, right? They don't have to have the stomata open. Um, and there's that pool, but then there's also these kind of intermediate pools within the mesophyll cells. And so um, when they're drought stressed, a lot of what we're seeing we think is coming from the mesophyll pools. But then once they're dead, it's, you know, they're not making any more. So it's all coming from evaporation from these resin canals. And so, um, the emissions are not very high, but it depends. If you know, the tree is out there and it's dead and it has these needles and it's warm out, you can see emissions. It just kind of depends on temperature and concentration and stuff. But yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. When does the when does the the pine the tree actually throw its new needles? Is that in the spring? Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How much of that increases? That's a great question. So actually, in, this, um, in the study I showed you from when we transplanted the trees, um, we actually saw, um, I wonder if I can just flip back real quick. Um, here. So this is actually June. This is when we started to see new needles. This is a ph phenological response right here. And so there's a huge, I mean, you can see, it doesn't seem like a lot to you guys, but um, this is a significant amount that's being emitted just because of the new needle flush and also 
um, we've seen when we do these chamber experiments on the trees that if you have a new flush of needles and then these resin balls that can form, that can also, I mean, now we're talking orders of magnitude higher emission rates, which you have to be careful because, you know, depending on what you're, you're sampling, you know, it can really blow your stats through the roof. And the other thing to consider is um, when they're masking. Right, so when they're making new cones, that's another time where you can see really huge emission rates with these resinous um, female cones um, on the trees. So, and that is a great point because I think when when we're trying to model emissions, we don't we're thinking about phenology, but those emission rates, like I said, I think there's a paper by Allison Eller where it is like orders of magnitude higher. Mm -hmm. That's a great point. Yeah. Monitor beam emission studies. Do you have any like speciation of monitor beams that change at all? That's like the composition? Yeah. Oh yes, very much so. Like in in response to like the this, herbivores. Yeah, or this drought cycle. And drought. Mm -hmm. I um I didn't show the individual compounds, but from that sumo experiment that we did, we measured um like 20 different terpenes. And so when I was kind of giving that quick rundown um here, basically. Yeah, these individuals, especially in response to drought, um, we saw that some were really, I mean, the emissions were completely dampened by, by the drought effect, where most of them were elevated, but some really important ones that are critical for bark beetles, like limonene, which is really toxic to them, it actually decreases under drought. And so while some people might say, oh, well, look at this tree is ramping up defenses, it should be more resistant to bark beetles, I think some of the key compounds that are really toxic to them might actually be decreased, um, which may actually make them more susceptible. So when you're just looking at the total, that's not a really good gauge for the ecological interaction. Yeah, it's a great question. And we see the same thing in response to the debris. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When you see reduced VOCs like from drought, or yeah. sorry, yeah, or mm -hmm. I should say, um, heightened VOCs from drought that you saw in your experiment. Yeah, yeah. Um, how much does that um, mediate bark beetle, um, I should say, like bark beetle mortality, like in outbreak conditions versus background mortality conditions? Like, it's like, what's the yeah? So, um, so the data that we're showing. Oh my gosh, this thing. So the data that I was showing you here. So these are um, these are actual concentrations in the needles and the um, woody tissue. Mm -hmm. And so we had emission data that I, um, I haven't processed for this site yet. But the thing to note is that what's happening here in the tissue may not actually be reflecting what's being emitted, right? For a lot of reasons. Physiochemical properties of the compounds themselves, diffusion, yada, yada. Um, and so your question is, how do these responses, how is that different for bark beetles versus just background mortality? Or yeah, how how are how is the defenses of the tree? How does that affect the bark beetles, or either how they're attracted or how they are responded to in outbreak conditions versus just like oh, just normal, normal, just like normal conditions. background. Yeah. Conditions. Well, so you know when we're talking about outbreaks, that is more than I mean the chemistry plays a role, but it is like kind of all of these different factors that have to coalesce across a landscape in order for this outbreak to occur, right? So there are multiple thresholds at different scales, right, at the, lo at the local stand and the like, landscape level that have to be reached in order for that to happen. And so I think you bring up a good point. So one thing that we know nothing about is just like, in general, what volatiles do the bark beetles even hone in on to find that susceptible tree across the landscape? We have no clue. We're trying to, that's what I'm working on right now. But then once you're in an outbreak mode, Right? So now you have lots of beetles across the landscape. Populations are really high. You have lots of drought stress trees. Defenses almost don't even matter. Right? right? So when you're in an outbreak, it's like, well, your beetle numbers are so high that you can overcome even really healthy trees. Like mountain pine beetle is a great example. Ips is a little wimpier. They actually really love dead trees. But, um, but you see what I mean? So it's like, I think you bring up a good point. This is really important for kind of understanding like the leading edge of outbreaks, and then once they're gone, it's, it's all about extent and severity predictions. It's a great question. Yeah. Well, that great question. Oh yeah.
she loves plants. I love it. Yeah, she's <laughs> at this year tennis uh, We'll be over across the street upstairs at the set in a few minutes. Please come join if you want to keep chatting with you another hand. Sounds good. Thank you. Okay. Right. Thank you. 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 Thank you.